Um, national service, by the way, is now impacting Arabs. This is a graph showing how Arabs are, are getting caught up in Shirut Lumi. And this is going to in intensify, by the way, as a result of the recent legislation. Um, let's talk about Jewish life. Most people think Israel is a secular. People are messed up about what they think about Israel. I mean, I've seen an American uh, focus group where they ask Americans to describe a street where there are several houses, and each house represents a country. And these Americans in the focus group are asked to describe the Italian house. And the Italian house is a fun house with great smells, and there's da 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 da, -da music going on, and there's a big mama who gives you a big hug when you walk in. Okay, and there's sort of a, a little uh, uh, shady, you know, uncle sitting smoking a cigar. And they, they, they describe in free association what it's like. They describe a Brazilian house as being a total party and people are samba and there's a, you know, a really attractive woman wearing a string, you know, thong, et cetera, et cetera. And they describe these things and they say, now describe the Israel house, please. And then there's silence. And you watch these guys, you can actually probably see some of this online and YouTube. They sit there. And then they start to talk. And one says, well, it's really dark. And there's barbed wire on the top of the house. And there are people in black coats. And they're not happy. And they don't want us in the house. OK? And they have no food. They don't offer us any food. And you know, it's like this, it's, you see this, and you freak out. Because you can't believe that people think that way about Israel. So people have all kinds of messed up ideas about Israel, certainly non-Jews. And it's also Jews. So in terms of like our religious identity, you ask Jews, tell me about Israel's religious practice. They're going to tell you things all over the place. Israel's secular. Israel's religious. Israel's sort of both. And the reality is somewhere in between. That in Israel, you will see people. I've been on Simchat Torah in my neighborhood, where what we do, you know, at many shuls, you go outside of your shul and dance. Do you guys dance in the street on Simchat Torah? I don't know if you do that in or not. In Israel, it's customary, at least in our neighborhood, to go out in the street and dance. Get the Torah out of the shul. Why should the Torah say in the shul to dance? Now, in our neighborhood, we took it a little step further and that people take their Torahs from around the neighborhood and they join other shuls. And it's sort of like a Yachad Shiftei Yisrael, together the tribes of Israel moment. So we have Sephardi shuls and Moroccan shuls and Ashkenazi shuls and Hasidus or Shtiblech. And everybody brings their Torahs and we dance and we block the streets. We don't just dance in the street. The streets are blocked. Now maybe that's not a nice thing because there are a lot of people who are not religious in our neighborhood, although most people are. And it sort of makes it, you know, you would think that people, if they came across this blockade, if you will, in the middle of the street on their holiday would start honking. Honk, get out of the way. I got to go. I got to go to the beach. I got to do whatever I got to do. But I'll tell you what happens every single time it happens. A car comes up. It stops. And the person gets out of the car, joins the not observing the holiday, OK, is driving on the Yomtu. OK, he's got an earring in his ear. But he stops the car, gets out, dances, kisses the tour. You will see people who are clearly shrimp, lobster-eating Jews kissing mezuzahs. You see it all over the place. Okay? And you try to figure this out. What does this mean? How does this work? But this is part of Israeli religious identity. So I've got some data to share with you. You can't really read this. And I'm happy to share these slides with people. I actually need glasses myself for this one. But you ask yourself, what is the percentage of Israeli Jews who have a mezuzah on their home? And this data is from Avi Hai Foundation. It's 98%. 98% of Israeli Jews have a mezuzah on their home. 85% um, of Israeli Jews have a Pesach Seder. 85%. Always light Hanukkah candles, down to 71%. Do not eat hametz on Pesach. This is a, a, a fairly shocking number. 68% of Israelis don't eat hametz on Pesach. There are lots of people who, in a very demonstrable way, will go to the Arab part of Akko or the Arab part of Jerusalem and buy pito. That's a big thing. Hey, I need my pito for the week. But the vast, vast majority of Israelis don't eat chametz on Pesach. 67% fast on Yom Kippur, which is, a, again, this is, these are numbers that I think indicate a much higher degree of sort of basic religiosity of some of the you know, key 
mitzvot about the Chagin than you would expect. Now, people praying in a synagogue every day, this says only 15%. I think it's low. Okay, I think there's actually, I think it undercounts Haredim and whatnot. I think that's probably, you know, 16% cover their heads at all times. Okay, so there's a, a, a range. People who, who don't travel on Shabbat, 27%. People who build a sukkah kechalacha, 41%. So it's very interesting. There are 14% of people, okay, who will travel on Shabbat, but they'll build a sukkah kechalacha. Okay, you know, and so anyway, just some really remarkable statistics here. And here's how Jews spend Shabbat. Turns out that 85% of Jews spend time with their family on Shabbat. 85% rest, 76% read, which I found very, very interesting. Okay, we have a big reading audience. 68% watch television or radio on Shabbat. Okay, which again goes back, now that's interesting. You have 27% who don't drive, 68% those sort of match, okay, in terms of the, you know, the, the, the numbers. And, uh, but interesting, only 17% shop because everything's closed, mostly. Okay, let's talk about uh, tikkun olam. Israel has, for a little country, a huge outreach program in the world. What we did in Haiti was off the charts. And you have to realize how amazing it was because <laughs> Haiti is right next door to the U.S. And when you look at who had the first operating hospital in Haiti after the earthquake, it was Israel. Not just to we beat the US, but the Israeli field hospital was operational for a full week before the US had a hospital. Now you ask yourself, how is that possible? The US is an hour flight from the US. From Israel, you have to schlep all the way. How did Israel get a, a hospital up and functioning and the only functioning hospital for a week? And the answer was that the Americans were very focused on permits, on planning, on making sure that everything was done correctly. And the Israelis just couldn't give a hoot. And they landed without a permit, they set up shop, and they started saving lives. And it was really, by the way, if you haven't seen the CNN reports about, you know, uh, this is, by the way, Elizabeth Cohen's interview with the Haitian doctor, no one but the Israelis have come to help any of our patients, okay, one week after the Haitian earthquake. Nature in the outdoors, this I love. It turns out we have a very little country. And one of the things I loved about growing up in America were the great outdoors. I spent many of my summers happily hiking around the mountains near Yellowstone and the Sierra Nevada and Mammoth Mountain and Lake Tahoe and I went to Baja, California. And I love the outdoors. I backpack, I hike, I fish, and I was, worried that I would lose that coming to Israel. I said, you know, Mayesh, turns out that in the US, which has been really the leader in national parks in the world, 15% of the land in the US has been set aside for national parks, for parks. In Israel, 20% of the land has been set aside. And I don't have data for other countries, I don't know where Israel stacks up, but I imagine that the US is pretty high. That's an extraordinary percentage of the land which has been set aside forever. And when you take the other land which is controlled by the army for Basisei Imunim and for training bases and whatnot, a lot of our land is being preserved. There are only two countries in the last century have actually increased forest cover, and that's the US and Israel. The rest of the world has got less trees 100 years after the turn of the century. And you ask yourself, how did the U.S. and Israel become those two countries? Well, the U.S. stopped chopping down their trees, and they let them grow back, and these vast forests recovered. And Israel started planting trees. But that's an interesting thing. Um, if you look at biodiversity, and this is a great one, because if someone gave me a glass of water, I would really appreciate it. A cup. And if time, I don't have with me. OK, thank you. Um, I was traveling in Costa Rica with my family. You know, I moved to Israel, but I still love to go around the world. Thank you. Um, as we were in Costa Rica, I was marveling to my son about all the amazing biodiversity in Costa Rica. You know, you all know that Costa Rica is the second, or it's actually the most biodiverse on a 
you know, per acre basis in the world, like the Amazon rainforest, and I'm, you know, rhapsodizing about how it's wonderful. And my son, Itamar, says, what are you talking about? Israel is incredibly biodiverse. And I said, come on, I love Israel. You can say lots of good things about Israel, but biodiversity, with all due respect, we have wildlife? Well, look at the numbers. Turns out in the US, there are about 20,000 plants. Israel has 2,400 plants. In the US, there are about 300 reptiles. Israel has 100 reptiles. In the US, there are 650 birds. In Israel, they're almost the same number, 530 birds. In the US, there are about 400 mammal species. In Israel, 100. So basically, on the plant side, Israel has 10 times the plants. But we have, you know, the US has about three times the reptiles, about the same number of birds, four times the mammals. It turns out that the US is 500 times the size of Israel. So Israel, in terms of biodiversity, is extraordinary. Can you imagine that there are 100 mammals running around Israel? That Israel is the last refuge of the Arabian wolf, which is still running wild? You ever gone to the Golan on one of these night jeep things where you basically take a flashlight and you shine it around and you see all the reflections of the wild animals? The country, I worked in Beit Shemesh for about six years. I had a company which I lived in Jerusalem and I worked in Beit Shemesh. And I would travel that half an hour road through the, the hills. And it really upset me because almost every other day I would see a fox or some kind of a wild animal killed on the road. And it was just horrific. I was like, I couldn't stand it. Because I said, my, oh, there's another one. We don't have enough. And until someone said to me, you don't understand. The reason you're seeing so many on the side of the road is because there are so, so many in the wilderness, in the Jerusalem hills of all places. There are wild animals running around like crazy. So it's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, Israel is obviously leading in probably almost every environmental technology, probably without, with the exception of wind. Okay, wind we're still behind, but in terms of geothermal, the leading company in the world is Ormat. In terms of desalination, the leading is Israel Desalination Equipment, IDE. Drip irrigation we invented at the theme. In terms of food technology, creating plant genomics, EvoGene, supplying genes to the five of the seven largest seed suppliers in the world. In terms of leadership in solar for a utility grade, Bright Source is building the world's largest solar plant in the Mojave Desert. We have 90% of our homes have solar water heaters. We have, uh, you know, well, leadership in electric cars, got to cross that one out. <laughs> okay. As of last week, we lost our $800 million bet. We tried, okay? Water recycling, it's amazing. If you look at, for example, this is unreal. You know that when you bite into a, a date in the Arab world, whether you're sitting in Iraq or Saudi Arabia or uh, even in Iran, you're probably biting into an Israeli date. Israel is the leading date exporter in the world. We export more dates than anybody else and they're all ending up, and Israeli dates are very highly regarded. They call them, you know, by different names, but no one makes a majul like, like we do in Israel today. Um, if you look at the water recycling business, Israel today is recycling about 70 plus percent of our water. So those delicious sweet cherry tomatoes that you eat, I don't want to tell you where the water initiated, okay? It's been properly treated and it makes the vegetables very sweet. Turns out that Spain is the second most recycling country in the world, about 10%. So Israel recycles seven times more water on a percentage basis than the next best country in the world. The US is about 1% in terms of its, I don't, again, don't have data on the UK. We're solving the water crisis around the world. Um, a lot of things going on between Israel and Asia now in terms of food, and my favorite thing here is what's going on with dairy. And you think that as Asia moves into the consumption of, of milk and milk products, India and China are now building huge dairy plants because they want to increase the amount of dairy in their, their diet. Where should they go to get the technology? Whose cow should they choose? A good British cow? Absolutely a good idea. A Swiss cow? Makes sense. A Dutch cow? All of the major contracts given 
by India and China and the dairy industry have gone to Israel. These are billion dollar contracts, to, most of them going to a place called Kibbutz Afikim, which has a company called Afimil, which private equity has invested in. But Israel leads the world today in the export of dairy technology. And believe me, our cows outperform everybody. If you don't believe me, believe Daniel Taub, the ambassador of Israel to uh, UK, who talked about it on Sunday at his speech. But more importantly, or less importantly, caviar is now safe. Okay, not safe for us who eat kosher, unfortunately. We haven't figured that one out. But there's been a big problem for the world's caviar consumers. The Caspian Sea, where the sturgeon originate, is polluted and overfished, and you can't get sturgeon out of them. And so literally caviar prices were skyrocketing. You couldn't get good caviar until some bright uberhochams at Kibbutz Dan in the north of Israel said, hey, we raise salmon in the, in the uh, Jordan River uh, you know, uh, headwaters. We can raise sturgeon. And they started creating the world's best caviar, which today, if you go and check in the best restaurants in London and New York, only Israel. In fact, Dean and DeLuca, if you look at their little you know, special they call it a Galilee Ocetra caviar, product of Israel. That's what Dina DeLuca sells in terms of their caviar. Um, Israel is saving the planet in so many ways. Don't believe me. Go to the website called Israel 21C. There's a great article which you can Google, and it just goes on and on and on in terms of the ways that our technology and the things that we're doing are, are, are really helping the planet survive. In terms of democracy, diversity, and culture, we've got to move quickly. You know, we all know that Israel has a huge democracy. You know, we have a, a, a you know what, what would happen if a member of parliament got up at question time tomorrow and essentially endorsed the beheading of the British soldier? How long do you think that member would be staying in parliament? What do you think would happen to them? Well, that's what happens in Israel. I mean, I'm not sure I'm proud of this, but it's a degree to which our democracy exists. Hanan Zuabi is able to say, Hamas and other Palestinian resistance factions are entitled to fire rockets for the sake of attaining their people's freedom. And then she joins the flotilla. That's Israel's democracy. At Haifa University, they got the university to stop playing the national anthem, Hatikva, at graduation ceremonies for fear of offending Arab students. I think this is democracy gone too far, frankly. But anybody who ever says, well, Israel's not a democracy. You don't treat the Arabs fairly. Give me a break. Um, one of the things I love to talk about is the diversity in Israel. I mean, this is what Israel looks like. Everyone thinks Israel's a white country. Think again. It turns out that the majority of the Jews living in Israel are Afro-Asian. I'm going to repeat this. The majority of the Jews living in Israel come from Africa and Asia. There are today huge numbers from North Africa, 800,000 from Morocco, about 200,000 from Libya and Tunisia, Egypt. Okay, there are huge numbers. Several hundred thousand each from Iraq and Iran. We have 100,000 Bukharans from Samarkand. We have 100,000 or so Kafkazis from near Baku. We have 75,000 Indian Jews. We have good kosher Indian food finally in Israel. 150,000 Ethiopians. Okay, roughly 130 according to this chart. And it's just an extraordinary story. And it, I'm very, very proud of that diversity. 350% um, of our population was absorbed since 1948. We basically are an immigrant absorbing society. And uh, in addition to the Jews, we have a whole bunch of really exotic, cool groups. Cherkessian, everyone knows what a Cherkessi is? These are Circassians. These are Muslims who were imported by the Turks to watch the railroad. And they today serve in the Israeli army with distinction. They're drafted into the Israeli army and they serve along the Jews. The African Hebrews having a great concert tomorrow night in Jerusalem um, on uh, the, the open air uh, mall. I hope to get there actually, uh, near Betzalel, about 9 p.m. tomorrow night if I get back from Tel Aviv in time. And there are about 5,000 of them. They basically believe that they are the descendants of the real Jews. They've grown hugely in Demona, and they really do good music. They're the largest black vegan community on the earth at the moment. Um, if you look at Druze, the Druze serve in the army like crazy. They're an incredible, interesting group. About 2% of the country is Druze now in, in Israel. And they're very, very, they're Druze ambassadors, Druze members of Knesset, and they're very, very committed to you know, supporting Israel. Um, if you look at what we've done with reviving Hebrew, 
Again, we take it for granted. We brought back, a, you know, it was never dead. I've got about five more minutes. So, okay. Israel was, you know, Hebrew was never dead, but the fact that his, his Hebrew was not a spoken language and came back has now become an example for other societies. So this is a picture of Laps from Lapland in uh, uh, Norway, I think it is, uh, who've now come to learn how to revive the Lap language. Um, we talk in terms of patents per capita, researchers per capita, university citations, Nobel Prizes. No other country produces the same number of Nobel Prizes per capita than Israel. We have the highest percentage of university graduates in the world. Today it's 50% of our young people are graduating from a four-year university. Our tuition costs are the lowest in the world. Despite the fact that our students love to strike about you know, free tuition, when I tell people in the States that my kid is going to a university, like a Hebrew university, and they say, well, what do you pay for tuition? I say, I can't tell you. So no, tell, come on, you tell me what you paid for your house or your rent. Tell me what you pay for tuition. And I look at them and I watch their face as I tell them, well, it's $2,000 a year. And these are people who are paying sixty dollars and $50,000 a year, a year, to send their kid to a U.S. university. And it's incredible. And our universities are ranking very, very well. We have the highest per capita publishing rate of books. We actually translate more books into Hebrew than many, many countries publish, okay, in terms of their own book output anywhere. We have the highest number per capita of symphonies and museums. One of the few countries in the world has a museum of taxation, which is one of my strangest ones that I've got. Um, and we, we, we simply don't give up. Our, our culture gets better. Um, I'm gonna leave this alone. Look, uh, this just came from an article about a week ago. You know, uh, basically, we are higher than the OECD average of our perception of well-being. The truth is that while we love to complain all the time, because to be Jewish is to be dissatisfied. We were complaining in the desert when Moshe Rabbeinu took us out of Egypt. First thing we start asking for is, where were the, the, the squash and the watermelons and the onions and the fish of Egypt? Well, guess what? We've always complained, we'll continue to complain, but every now and then we should thank God for the great blessings we have because what's going on in Israel is really an amazing story. That's work in progress, that was the first thing. I'll be happy to take your questions. We've got exactly five minutes. Go ahead. Um, it's a very good question. First of all, before I do anything else, I would like you to please put your emails, do it quickly so I can get this out of here. I like to collect people's emails so I can put you on my own mailing list. If you want more information about this, obviously you don't want to, don't give it to me, but I'm happy to have you and share information with you about what I'm doing and the stuff that I, I see and, and, and I won't spam you too much, I promise. Um, Israel's cost of living is going through the roof. Okay, it's really expensive to live in Israel. And you guys all know that we had a social protest movement two summers ago that was centered around cottage cheese, because cottage cheese really is an iconic Israeli food. It's not the Israeli breakfast that you get at the King David or the David Citadel. It's the cottage cheese, tomato, and cucumber that is the real Israeli breakfast. And when the little tin of cottage cheese becomes priced at about eight or nine shekels, Israelis went nuts and went on Facebook and basically started boycotting it and actually forced Tanuva to its knees to start bringing down the prices of cottage cheese. So now it's actually more like six shekels. It's back up again, it goes up and it goes down. But the, the reality is that our, our living expenses are way too high. And this is a result of too much monopolistic practices. In other words, people like, to, there's huge concentration. There aren't that many dairies. Tanuva has got this wonderful dairy business but they're not selling the stuff at a reasonable price, and they're just you know, gouging Israeli consumers. And Israelis are getting fed up by it, okay? And so people like Rami Levy have gone into the food business and have just you know, chopped prices, but the producers still need to be sort of beaten up. And you know, there have been some moves against monopolistic practices like what happened with cell phone 
uh, you know, plans, the, you know, Golan and, and what uh, Kahlon, who was the uh, Minister of Communications, did. But we need a lot more monopolistic, you know, practice busting. We need to bust cartels. And today, to be a tycoon has not been a particularly popular thing in Israel. Everybody in Israel hates the tycoons. And it's, a, you know, it's actually spilling over to make people sort of question capitalism, which is not good. Because capitalism, you know, free capitalism, where you can actually be an entrepreneur is a good thing. But you know, getting a concession to essentially gouge people is not a good thing. So um, it turns out, though, that there are issues that are not so obvious. For example, the housing issue. Right now, the government's trying desperately to bring down housing prices. And that's a good thing. You want you know, young people to get into the housing market, be able to afford a house, you can't buy a house in you know, many of the central areas in the country. But what people forget is our percentage of home ownership is huge. Israelis, 70% of Israelis own their own home. 70% of Israelis own their own home. It's one of the highest percentages of home ownership in the world. Germany, by the way, is about 45%. I don't know the percentage here in the UK. But so that when you talk about bringing down prices, you're affecting everybody. And I would per personally look for the government to provide you know, easy money or mortgage assistance to young couples who want to get into the game. But remember, every young couple doesn't have a God-given right to live in Tel Aviv. Right? In other words, if you start off, you can go live in Demona, you can live in you know, the, the Galil and whatnot. We need to move more people out to the periphery. But I think that there's a huge issue in terms of cost of living. And it's really expensive, and it, and it creates angst. I mean, the, the protest movement was a huge movement. There were 400,000 people one night in Tel Aviv. That's 5% of the country's population without protesting. And these are good people. And, and, and there is a, a, a huge sort of sense that somehow the country has gotten a little bit out of hand in terms of people, you know, making, some people making too much money. There's a lot of inequality in the system right now. Uh, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and there are a lot of poor. Um, I think the poor numbers are overstated, okay, because the, the, big, the big elements in the poor are Haredis and, and, and uh, Arabs who don't report much of their income. The last time you got a, uh, you know, a cheshbonit uh, mas from a mohel was never, okay, if you, don't, you don't get a tax receipt from your mohel. Why? Because he lives on tips. Okay, but uh, that's a joke. No one laughed at me. Uh, but anyway, the the reality is that that uh, there is poverty that needs to be uh, you know attacked. Go ahead. That's a really good question, and I'm just going to give you a guess. I don't have the, the you know, when I don't know something, I'll tell you. My guess is that it's probably less than 20% are still mamashi tufi, okay? That the vast majority of kibbutzim have already gone through privatization. Um, there's some very wealthy kibbutzim now. I mean, the, you know, the kibbutzim that own Netafim or the kibbutzim that own uh, what's called Plasan, which is, uh, you know, kibbutz Sasa. And many of the kibbutz industries are really taken off. And of course, the kibbutzim were given a lot of land, okay, which they've now sold. So kibbutz Ramat Rachel has sold land to these incredible apartments, you know, in Talpiot, uh, near where I live. And that money, you know, by and large, went to, to fund these members of the kibbutz. So, um, but there's some many many kibbutzim that are not doing so well. And I don't think I, I don't think the numbers of the ones that are still shoot to feed are over 20 percent. But you know what? If you uh, send me an email, I will check into that number and get back to you because that, that interests me. Hey, I was just wondering, you have a reference, I can maybe read more about it, or just get an updated information that would really help. Okay. You can think of any. I'll take one or two more questions. I'm going to wait for this to go out. I'll, 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 I'll. Go ahead. One, one or two more questions. OK, well, I'm going to pack up. And you can please continue to put your names on this. I appreciate you guys listening, and we'll be back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as John mentioned, first of all, thank you very much for that. That um, that uh, really, really uplifting, uh, inspiring information. Some of which we've known, a lot of which we don't, and certainly gives us food for thought. And um, in our 
in our conversations with the many people that we uh, we uh, interact with on a daily basis. It certainly gives us a lot of uh, um, information to uh, share. Um, John also very kindly mentioned that um, perhaps we can send this around and yes. uh, sort of in, in, the, in the crowdfunding model, I'm um, sure a lot of people can add value and we can come up with it. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. So we can create something very powerful that we can all share and um, it will um, help all of us. Thank you very much for coming this evening. Huh? Next week on Wednesday, we have Bill Benjamin, um, a top. Um, um, man in finance and property. I think he's uh, the staff of the Apollo uh, real estate division here in Europe. He's also the chairman of the UJIA. Um, fascinating guy coming all the way from America. Um, he lives here in London now, but he's American, and um, we hope you can make it. That's next Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, please enjoy the rest of the session.